<laughs> I like to call the uh, RIO CAC meeting to order. Uh, David, would you read the county, please read the county notice. Yes. Uh, this meeting is being held pursuant to and in compliance with the emergency ordinance number 20-A16, an emergency ordinance to ensure the continuity of government during the COVID disaster. The committee members who are electronically pleasant, pre uh, present at this meeting are uh, Marty Meth, Tom Galetti, Judy Schlusel, uh, Marty Davis, Todd Cohn, Lee Condor, Nancy Hunt, Nicole Scro, Rick Seaman, Peter Thompson, and this is where I'm going to uh, lose track, Ned Galloway, the board liaison. Uh, did I mention Nancy Hunt? I think I did. And I think Dan Bailey. Dan, yes, I see Dan Bailey, yes. And, and Audrey. Uh, Audrey uh, Kirker. Okay. I think that covers it. The staff that are present are Carolyn Schaefer, clerk uh, for the County Planning Commission and Committees. David Benish, development process manager, um, is also present. Okay. The next order is uh, our minutes for January meeting. Does anybody have any comments? Nancy had one small correction, which we've noted already, and just the typing. Anybody else have any? Tom? Well, I've just got, are there any excused abs absence uh, today? No. Okay, just wanted to check. Thank you. Okay, I think we're only missing one member right now. Okay, so can I have a motion to approve the minutes, please, somebody? So moved. Okay, and Judy seconded, are all in favor? Please raise your hands. Okay, so done. Okay, so let me just explain for a minute the next, the major topic on the, for this meeting is the Rio Corridor Plan, phase one comments upon, on it. We are going to have both ourselves have an opportunity to comment as well as the public. I see we have about 10 attendees. I'm not sure they all have comments. Let's start ourselves a little bit and I may switch in the middle. Now, Brian is here too as well, Tom. So I think we have everybody. Um, so uh, in no particular order, I'm just looking at this at, at my screen. Uh, Tom, you want to make the first set of comments? Do you have comments? Uh, Marty, can I just do a quick uh, kind of intro just to make sure that the public's on? on sure, on. okay. Yeah, and, and hopefully I'll be very brief in my remarks and um, just summarize where we are. Um, as you, you all know, the consultant has completed a written draft of the phase one plan. Uh, that plan generally reflects what we reported to the Board of Supervisors in October and then afterwards reported back to the CAC. I don't think there's any major changes in the recommendations. Um, we clarified on the John Warner Parkway that we're not recommending any change to the location um, and that we're moving forward with the funded um, option, uh, VDOT funded option for the roundabout. Um, the document that uh, is available for review here and that we'll get, we're getting comments on is the uh, uh, is a draft that we intended to, to keep as a short, focused, uh, to the point read um, with the basic essentials in the main body of the document. Uh, we do uh, intend to have a more full uh, appendix that'll have a little bit more of the detail that the consultant developed, but the idea is to keep the main document uh, very uh, graphically oriented, um, clear and concise and, and not too heavy to have to read through. Uh, we are getting these comments at this point in time. It's these are sort of first round of comments on the written draft of the document. Uh, we're not gonna do any other vetting of phase one until we complete the phase two portion of the quarter study. And then we're going to mesh and bring those two together, phase one and phase two. And then that full document will go out for review again. So theoretically, people have an opportunity to comment on phase one again. Hopefully, we'll have most of our comments and we can clean that section up and 
later on we'll focus more on phase two, but there will be a full um, corridor plan consisting of both sections of the quarter study that will be moving forward to the Board of Supervisors, we hope, um, in the May, June timeframe. Um, so again, we're asking you to provide us some of your comments, any questions or um, issues that you might have with the form of the document and uh, that's and any public that's here that might want to weigh in, we're, we're here to listen. We have Kendra Patrick and Ryan Cheney who have been integral in developing the plan for line and grade. And between those two and myself, we'll, we'll take your comments and answer any questions you might have. So that, that's it. I'm going to put up on the screen, Marty, yeah. uh, just the rollout that shows all the improvements. Um, can everyone see? Uh, that? Not yet. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Um, so um, just, just for a reminder for everyone, this is the section of phase one and essentially there are four main recommendation areas, three intersections, and then the areas in between. This is actually page 14, which is of the plan, which kind of summarizes the uh, improvements and the implementation steps. So working uh, sort of in the opposite direction that we usually do, right to left, we have the John Warner Parkway, the Belvedere uh, 29 intersection. Um, then number three at the uh, western end is the um, Hillsdale Northfield Old Brook um, intersection. And then Four is really the cross section or the infills between those major projects. Um, and just to let you know, staff has provided some comments to the consultant. Some of those have been incorporated into this draft. Uh, most have not. Uh, almost all of the staff comments are more or less wordsmithing and not real substantive. But we have, just to let you know, we have asked uh, the consultant to give us a little bit more information about um, implementation strategy for those infill improvements. As you read throughout the plan, there's a, a number of pages that actually talk about those improvements, but this page doesn't really summarize them and prioritize them. So just to give you an example of, of where we are in this process, um, you know, we hope to consult and collect all the comments that we hear that make further updates to this uh, phase one. So that was it. I kind of just wanted to give everyone sort of an overview of where we are. And Marty, I'll turn it back over to you now. Okay. And I will take this off the screen, but uh, we'll be happy to put it back up if that's if helped anybody. Sure. Okay, so I'm going to ask the uh, attendees who are here, if you have a question, you'll just raise, use the raise the hand function and we'll monitor it and we'll call you. The other thing I was going to ask you, David, and maybe also the people from Line and Cross, are the comments that are made, are they going to be documented and included somehow in the report or in an appendix or what is the process for that? Um, I think we can do that. I think there was an intention in the appendix that we were gonna assimilate uh, or put together a summary of the comments. And I think you may have seen um, that we have created some charts that sort of summarize major topic areas mm -hmm. and the number of comments that we've heard. We will uh, uh, we'll be putting that into the document and we can continue to collect those comments. Okay, fine, thank you. Tom, would you like to start? Do you have comments? Uh, sure, um, I guess uh, my comments mostly center on, uh, well, the three changes. I, I particularly like the, uh, the T intersection change at Belvedere. Uh, I think that will do a lot of uh, good for residents coming out of there. I have been using that exit, trying to turn north to see what it was like, and I find it quite challenging. And uh, so anything that would make that easier, uh, I really appreciate. Uh, the peanut-shaped roundabout, though, I have some mixed feelings about that, about how safe that might be for people coming down Old Brook Road or or. Northfield coming into the intersection. Um, I can, I, I don't have any problem now with that intersection. I mean, it, maybe it's because of the time of day I use it. 
Uh, but I, I don't mind those lights. And I'm a little worried about the intersection of the safety because I, everyone coming down Northfield is going to be making a right-hand turn to either go north or east on Ryle or down Hillsdale Drive. Um, so that's going to be a little out of traffic. All the people coming up from the apartments across from Old Brook will be making a, a right-hand turn. Uh, they just they go east. Or go, I mean, go north and Ryle Road. Um, I'm just a little concerned about if the intersection is built that way. I hope it's a very long peanut, you know, maybe a three or even four nut in the shell type of peanut, because I think it's going to take a lot of room to merge over. And I mean, I go down Old Brook to Ryle Road three out of four times I leave my house, and I typically go down Hillsdale Drive almost half the times I go down there. And I'm a little concerned about making that transition from going left in the left-hand lane of the peanut, then merging right to get down to Hillsdale Drive. And the same thing coming back from Hillsdale Drive, coming into the intersection and having to move over another lane in that short distance to make a right-hand turn on Old Brook Road headed north. I mean, I'm quite concerned about that for me. I can see the advantages of the throughput improvement for, for through traffic, but for the local residents, I'm a little concerned about the usefulness of this, the loss of convenience, uh, some of the safety issues. Um, I'm not too sure we're gaining much. I mean, I see most of these improvements uh, mostly geared to through traffic, but I think the local traffic will pay a high price in convenience particularly for the third improvement, the one, the um, elimination of the turn lane from Hillsdale Drive south towards Greenbrier. I, I'm not too sure that's going to be well received by a lot of residents down there. Maybe it will be, I don't know. But I'm a little worried about the increase in traffic over the next 10 to 15 years. I mean, I remember one where our road was a two lane road and now it's a four lane road. And I mean, the, the volume of traffic is quite, quite heavy. It's going to get a lot heavier between now and the next 10, 15 years. And these improvements, although necessary, I don't know they go quite far enough to accommodate the increased traffic that's going to be coming down here. And I think the local residents are going to pay a very high price for making Ryle Road the primary means to get from north end of the county to downtown and then to the east end of the county of Pantops. So, I mean, I like the changes. I like the recommendations for the most part, but I'm very concerned about um, the effect on local traffic. I just think it's going to be um, difficult. That's about all I like to say, thanks. Okay, thank you, Tom. Um, Lee, you had your hand up. Everybody will get a chance to talk one at a time. I'd like to just try to go around a little bit. Uh, I know you have circulated a, a document to everybody that sort of talks a little bit about what Tom said, but we'll get to that. I'd like to hear, uh, Todd, did you have any comments? Um, <clears throat> yeah, there's, again, there, there's still nothing in there for uh, the uh, intersection at uh, Putt Putt and Rio. Okay, that that just well, okay. I don't... Yeah, I, maybe I can speak to that yeah, real quickly. That. Um, that section, although the the consultant has considered it and looked into it, is um, technically really within the small area plan study, and there are recommended improvements. Uh, ultimately in the small area plan that show a potential relocation and traffic uh, roundabout in that area. Uh, we perceive that that is going to be a much longer term and expensive project, um, but there is that recommendation and that recommendation is still a valid one and one that we're interested in ultimately implementing, but the cost of it, the need to um, work with property owners and probably to reasonably acquire the land to make any relocation of Hillsdale work 
um, which is the most significant aspect of the small area plan is probably a longer term project. That's why the improvement at Hillsdale now here, the peanut is important, seen as a, a shorter term and more viable uh, solution. Uh, but within the putt putt area, there is a roundabout that is proposed and that is, um, and one of the things maybe we can do is make a, a reference to that to show the transition so people can understand that that recommendation is there. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Uh, Lee, you had your hand up first, so go ahead. Let me ask you a question. Oh, unmute yourself, please. Okay. Um, well, as Marty mentioned, I already submitted my comments in writing. The only thing I want to add or emphasize is that uh, between the proposed roundabout at Hillsdale and, and Rio and uh, putting a median uh, 20 feet wide from Hillsdale all the way down to uh, uh, the railroad bridge uh, is a $20 million uh, cost. Uh, so you're going to spend, proposing to spend $20 million on less than two miles of road and to maybe address a problem at Hillsdale uh, intersection, which could be solved for a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, I, I just don't see where that money's going to come from. Who's going to spend $20 million on less than two miles of road? Uh, I can't see smart scale funding going to come up with that. The county certainly isn't going to pay for it. Uh, and that's not even counting the eight or $9 million for the roundabout at, at uh, uh, John Warner Parkway, which is funded, but uh, yeah, you're at the point now where you can almost a, uh, build a, a, a bypass around it um, for as much money as you're gonna spend here. So uh, that, that's, that's all I have to say. Okay, I just would add just to Lee's being a little modest, he had a long uh, 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 detailed set of comments and uh, he did point out an alternative um, traffic light pattern, which I have to admit, I don't totally understand, but I would like the consultants if that should be recognized as an alternative at the Hillsdale, peanut, instead of the peanut, uh, shaped uh, roundabout. He had proposed uh, setting up the uh, traffic lights a little bit different with traffic counters. I thought that was interesting and should be taken into account. So I think, okay, with that, Nan, uh, Judy, you had your hand up and then Nancy. Judy, you're, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so I have um, several things, so I'll talk fast. So I don't wanna uh, overtake my time. Um, a little bit to piggyback on what Tom said. An another thought is, and David very briefly touched upon this, the cost of acquiring the land for the peanut shaped uh, roundabout. Um, also, um, I was able to chat with Daniel. So, um, and I'm hoping that he shared Part of our conversation with the rest of the team from line and grade but on page seven whereas he, they thought he said that uh the board thought that the peanut shape would be great um i do believe that the board's words were implied that it was great to be thinking outside the box they didn't want you to take it as gospel so anyway that's enough said about that uh, page eight, we talked about landscaping, and I know that uh, David and I have had um, some writings back and forth, and he talked about the landscaping, that it's improvements in many areas of the county, but what I have a question, not only for the medians, then why does the county allow clear cutting for all the developments uh, as they are approved, and then you're putting in these trees on the median strips. I'm very concerned about what's gonna go first, the road, the median, or are you gonna have the plants waiting off on the side? Um, so that's on that one. Uh, page 13, they talked about the demographics and they added the area about Greenbrier. And 
I just, my mouth dropped open. It's like, why include Greenbrier? It's not part of the Rio corridor plan. And they talked about how close uh, Whole Foods and Kroger's, if this document has been in the works since October, why wasn't it updated to include Aldi's? That's within walkable distance. So enough on that one. Um, and then Dan, uh, David and I also talked about the sidewalks, which doesn't have much to do with the Rio quarter plan, but then again, it does because we're putting it down and then taking it up. So a lot of um, resources that are gonna be used and destroyed. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. So mainly I just wanted you know, my comments to go on record that there are many areas of the Rio quarter uh, phase one draft that I've got some concerns with. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I see every well, uh, everybody on the committee has their uh, hand up. I will get to everybody. So I'm not ignoring anybody. Uh, okay, uh, Nancy, you had your hand up very early. So go ahead, please. Uh, several quick points. One, I'm sure that the guy who owns property between Oldbrook and what is it, North Side, the block where the peanut would cover, will be delighted to have the peanut because it means people won't be cutting through his private property to avoid the stoplight. You would be surprised at how often that happens and the number of notices he has posts saying this is not a through street on his driveway which goes from one street to the other. Um, point two, Lee, I will tell you that I read your documentation. Uh, I'm fascinated by the numbers, but unfortunately I'm not versed enough to completely understand what you were pointing out. I do agree that there are issues in the Hillsdale um, Rio intersection and th there were a lot of accidents. And David, I don't know if you will remember, and Lee, it was probably before you joined the board that there was a timing issue with the stoplights um, and that was causing some of the crashes. VDOT has, or the county has, whoever does it, retimed those lights. And I wonder at the point, uh, David, where they retimed the lights, is there a break between accidents before the retiming and fewer accidents after? I think that would be a worthwhile point of uh, information and surely someone has those numbers easily accessible. Um, I do know that both the, the roundabout at uh, the end of John Warner and the peanut have evoked some rather uh, broad unhappiness amongst people, both in the Dunlora in that area and also um, the peanut itself closer to that area. So I think the question here, and maybe this is something Judy or those of you who live in Dunlora to ponder, Right now, traffic isn't fun, but it's not horrible. As development proceeds, traffic will probably get worse. And I guess the question for me is, if we do nothing, either on the roundabout or the peanut, um, what will happen? And if we do something, can we forestall the worst of accidents? But my final point, and I will illustrate it with what happened the other day. I frequently go up Hillsdale, hang a left on Rio, to go to ACAC. I do this almost every day. And it's a short distance between those two lights. So if the Rio Hillsdale is red, the next one is also red, but that doesn't seem to stop people from running the red light. I just happened to watch a huge black truck fly through the first dead red light 
And as I made my left turn, I pulled up beside him and I lowered my window and I said, gee, that was quite a red light you ran. And he said he didn't care. He was a lot not so polite about it. And in retrospect, I suppose he could have pulled a gun out and shot me, but he didn't. Um, the enforcement of traffic regulations and speeding is really a poaching zero. You can make all the traffic changes you want, but if everybody is speeding and everybody is ignoring everybody else on the road, it's not gonna make a difference. And so I think some attention has to be given to changing driver attitudes about stopping at red lights and encouraging them to stop. And the same would be true of stop signs. And I think this is probably endemic throughout the county, although I am most familiar with this immediate area. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, uh, Marty Davis. Uh, I agree with a lot of a lot that's been said, of course, especially Judy's concern about the uh, plantings and the trees and the upkeep and all of that. And one other concern I have is the Belvedere. If if we don't put a light there, are they still going? They're still. And and I had a hard time because I'm having to do everything on my phone and iPad while I'm out of town. Are they still going to have to cross two lanes of traffic to go left? to merge into the uh, lanes going towards John Warner? Yes. So if we don't have a light there, I, 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 it just seems like it's going to still be a, a problem, even though it's, the lanes are not as long or wide that they will have to cross. And those are basically my concerns, questions. Okay, thank you. Um, Audrey. Hi. Um, we seem to be requesting information on data and data-driven solutions. I repeat a question and concern that I had at last meeting. At what level of traffic are roundabouts and peanuts ineffective? Where can I get that answer? Is there, other than just Googling it, is there um, some definition or data that could be reviewed and used to make decisions. Um, I think we're approaching problems on these roads and it's time to talk about bypasses and long, long-term planning. Thank I think you. Maybe, I think maybe Ryan can respond to the um, capacity issues for roundabouts. Yeah, capacity is a good word, thank you. Yeah, so uh, first of all, I wanna say thank you for all the interaction here. There's a, there's a lot to take in. Um, a lot of what you said we're aware of, um, but just to speak quickly to that and a, and a couple of things, there's been a lot of comments on the Hillsdale roundabout. So um, the general rule of thumb, and this is a very, very loose rule of thumb, is single lane roundabouts can handle upwards of 25,000 vehicles per day. Um, we're at around, I believe, 33,000 or so along the, this portion of Rio. So any roundabout would have to be a, what they would either say a, a traditional dual lane or a hybrid. Um, the one that they're installing at the JWP intersection is what that's called a turbo roundabout. So part of it is one lane and part of it is dual lanes. Uh, it's basically dual lanes where they need it to be and uh, single lanes where it doesn't. And these things are designed with that in mind, uh, with, with the capacity of the roadway in, in mind. So when we show these images, we are not claiming that we have designed, and this is the solution and it specifically handles all the traffic, right? What we're, what we're trying to communicate is this type of intersection would yield positive results in this location. When the final design happens, that will be when all of these things will be checked, making sure that yes, the roundabout can handle the capacity of all the future projected traffic, um, that it can handle uh, you know, every maneuver without having to change lanes in the roundabout. In modern roundabouts, you, you don't, there's no permitted lane change within the roundabout. They're designed so that you, you pick your lane and you stay in it throughout the whole thing. Um, so 
please keep that in mind that all of these improvements that we're showing, they're not final designs, they're very conceptual in nature. Um, and the typology of the intersection or, or the improvement that we might show, uh, we think is the best from our study, but it still would need further refinement and engineering before it would actually go out and be constructed. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have uh, somebody, uh, one of the attendees, Bob Drake. Maybe Carolyn, could you bring him in? I'd like to hear somebody from the outside for a second and we'll get back to everybody else. Sure, Mr. Drake, please. Um, yourself and say your name, address, if you're associated with a group or organization and your time starts when you start speaking. You have to unmute yourself. I may have to come back to him since I, I can't unmute him. I've asked him to unmute, but... Um... You're right. I understand that. Okay, we'll stop. Uh, Peter Thompson. Peter Thompson, the center. Sorry, my camera's not working, so sorry. I can't show myself to you all, but I can see you. Um, first, I want to thank the consultant for all the work. It's, it's a lot of work. <laughs> It's very much, I don't know if it's human nature, but American nature, we seem to be picking everything apart instead of talking about some of the good in it. There's there's a lot of good in here and I, I appreciate that. Um, and I do want to support all of the, uh, the road diet um, uh, design features in here, such as a median in the middle and things. I think we need to aim for that. Funding's an issue, but I think we need to, to strive for those things because being a, a really several times a, a week, uh, five, six times a week user, um, yeah, the, the, the cars are just flying on that road and it's just dangerous for everybody. It's getting worse. So I think safety has got to come first. And I think a lot of what's in there is going to help with that. So I appreciate that um, to Ryan and all his team. Um, you know, I don't know that the, the uh, peanut intersection area to me is a major safety problem and a, it's going to get worse. I think it absolutely needs some significant addressing. Um, you know, Judy or uh, uh, someone mentioned earlier some of the um, problems there, Nancy did, and, and that's true. It's just the way it's designed causes people to do the wrong thing, which makes it um, worse and worse and worse. So, but I don't, I am concerned with the design that's being suggested. Um, I really try to keep an open mind that something that uh, is different doesn't necessarily mean bad, but I just can't wrap my arms around how well it's going to work um, for, for much of anybody other than the through traffic, uh, pedestrians, bicyclists, runners, <clears throat> and cars trying to get back and forth across. I think are really going to suffer with that. I don't know what the answer is, but I'm not thrilled based on what I've seen and what I've heard from others about how that's going to work. Um, you know, the Belvedere intersection, I, I, yeah, the green tea is certainly a lot better than what we have today. It's certainly a lot better, I think, than the R cut that was proposed a couple of years ago. Um, I would, I'm glad that now it does talk about a traffic signal being considered. Uh, I would encourage us to, to not, uh, at this early stage, limit it just to during peak time or peak hour. Because uh, as we talked with uh, many people between Saka and the center and other usage, it's not just at rush hour in the morning and the afternoon. There's a lot of other times that, you know, we can have two or 300 people leaving the neighborhood within an hour. And uh, there's a way to get a signal there that can sense, I know there's smart traffic signals that cost more, but the can sense any time that there is a, a large load of cars coming in and out of there, um, that a signal could be, be used. I'd like us to keep a, a broader mind of that in this early stage of the report. Um, and then my other uh, uh, thought, I'm perplexed. I can't I have a hard time keeping up with where there's bike lanes and where the multimodal is carrying both pedestrians and bikes. Um, I would love it if we could find a safe way to not have pedestrians and bicyclists using the same path. I think that's a disaster way to, to happen. Um, bicycles fly fast, they're coming downhill. Sadly, too many walkers and runners wear earphones and aren't paying attention. It works both ways. Then uh, I think that's that's an accident waiting for happen. So I, I hope we consider that when we do anything final. Um, I've got a lot of other nuts and bolts, but I don't think it's worth it at this early stage. Uh, so I'll, I'll yield the floor. Thank you. We may be able to come back. Nicole, please. Thanks, Marty. Um, uh, I guess I'll go really fast. Um, I 
I, I don't, I think all the intersections are fine. All the intersection improvements, um, I understand like they're so much better than what we have now. And I understand that, you know, there's going to be an engineering calculus as, as far as capacity. Um, so I, I'm fine with the intersections. I, I really like the green tea um, compared to the R cut. So just to reiterate Peter's um, point, but I, what my only concern really was, I don't see like a pedestrian or bike, like there should be some sort of at least show where we're missing some of those improvements and where we can, um, and maybe staff is addressing this um, at the beginning, but like the implementation section and line and grade did something similar like this um, plan in at fifth and Avon. And they kind of um, highlighted a few smaller pedestrian projects that could go forth um, and like the um, anyway, some smaller projects that don't hit on the major intersections would help to just make this feel like it can actually be traversed by bikes and, and people. Um, there's a lot of great language in like the first, in the beginning of this packet about that, but I don't, I don't see it in the implementation stages. Um, the same with public transit. Um, and so I'm just wondering where that, where that comes back, um, and I also saw, I guess, is I'm just curious, um, the John Warner um, roundabout, I saw that I, I like the alternative that was proposed by line and grade, but I saw that, I guess, um, the decision has been made that the community um, likes the VDOT alternative. I'm, I'm just curious where that came from um, and where VDOT is in that process. Um, okay, anyway, thank you. I do really like the improvements. I think it'd be great for um, this corridor. Okay. Yeah. Ready, do you, yeah. What? Do you want me to just answer Nicole's last question about the schedule since you had you had, had that question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. For the roundabout. Um, since other folks might be interested in that too and comment on it. Um, so what staff and the consultant determined was that since we have a funded project um, already uh, to this study would best just help inform VDOT of the issues related to the improvements in that area. So we've assumed that we're gonna move forward with the already funded project um, and just identify some of the issues and findings that we found in the analysis of that project. And that's what the draft has tried to convey. Uh, and we're, we're not recommending any further changes to it, but those changes, as Ryan alluded to, when you go from a conceptual design to an actual design, BDOT will be stepping through the planning process for that location that's funded and issues and, and alternatives may come up in their process. In terms of the timing for that project, what we understand is that um, the survey work will be taking place in 2022 this year uh, with preliminary engineering running through the fall of 2023 and final design and right of way acquisition in 2024 uh, with construction um, in 2025, 2025, hopefully completed in 2025. Um, bear in mind, this is a design build project. So those dates are kind of broad dates because design build, you're actually designing the project while you begin certain phases of development. So the numbers are a little bit different than a traditional build process, but those are sort of the threshold dates that we have from BDOT at this point in time. Thank you. Hey, David, sorry, oh, can I just, just to clarify, the, it seemed to, the um, proposal seemed to pit the, the VDOT alternative against line and gray's proposal. Are you saying that the line and gray proposal will inform VDOT's design and then they're gonna go through their process what we're saying is that uh, we're assuming that we're continuing forward with the VDOT design and their development process, but we've, we've included in the study the information that the consultant looked at because that information may be useful and it documents what the consultant's analysis did and the pros and cons of that relocation. But the preferred alignment is to maintain the VDOT alignment and continue to work through that process. Okay, Rick, please. Yeah, I'll try to keep my comments brief uh, because um, the other folks have already expressed a lot of what I've been thinking, but I'll take each of the, the three major components and quickly. 
but just to follow on with the uh, roundabout at uh, John Warner Parkway, I like the idea of it. Uh, I like the design of it. The only thing I would like to, to go on record with saying that I would prefer that they that when VDOT does its final design work, that it figures out some way to get the uh, entrance into Dunlora so that it comes directly into the roundabout somehow and doesn't come out on Rio, on old Ryle Road, because I think that's still going to be a choke point, even though it's going to be basically right out only. It's still, I don't think it really solves the problem as well as it could. On the uh, entrance into Belvedere, I really like the green tea. And I really like the fact that it is flexible enough in its design so that it can accommodate a uh, northbound traffic light if that seems to be a desirable thing to do and still protects the southbound traffic from, from having to stop uh, on, its, on its through path. So I, I really like the fact that that, that that design has the ability to flex and, and uh, evolve as, uh, as demand requires. Going up to the, the Hillsdale intersection, yeah, even while the, the, the donut design may be outside the box and may be a little bit off-putting and a little bit concerning, it, it's, I've looked at it, there are many times that when I'm coming uh, up from the, you know, the Greenbrier area up going west on Ryle Road and want to go down Hillsdale Drive. Uh, and, and I can see where that's going to be a, a, a little bit of, you know, an, an annoyance, but it's so much better than the way it is now. Not only have I seen what Nancy has seen in terms of people running the red lights, one of the ones that actually caused me to, to experience a rear end collision uh, by somebody running into me at the second, at the, at the old brook, uh, traffic light was the fact that the, the light was turning yellow just as I went under it and went under the one at, at the Northfields and Hillsdale. And so I prepared to stop for the second one. Well, you've only got a couple hundred feet there to, to make that decision. So I made the decision to stop and the guy behind me was going to run the second red, second yellow light and wound up rear ending me. So that, that whole thing just simply doesn't work as it is. I don't think there's any way that you could signalize it so that somebody isn't going to run one of those lights. And uh, to say, I'm, I think the, the donut is kind of an interesting solution. And, and I think people get used to it. I think those are my main comments. The others you know, that I agree with have already been made. Thanks. Thank you, Rick. Uh... Brian, do you have any comments? Uh, well, just to follow that up, I will say uh, roundabout is inherently different from a traffic light in that it is geometrically controlled, meaning there is a big barrier in the center of the intersection. That people cannot speed through it, physically cannot speed through it. So there's not, there's not the option to, to run it. Um, they could ignore the yield sign, but even that, the, the the entrances to those are designed such that you have to make a, a fairly sharp turn in to, to enter the roundabout. So that also slows down speed. Um, so these things are people people have thought about these things quite a bit and they're they're much better than the the older traffic circles you hear about in, in Europe um, that have a lot of problems. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think I've gone around everybody on the committee. I don't see any hands right now. Uh, I had uh, communication from somebody who couldn't make it an attendee tonight. And I just wanted to put that in for the record. This comment was uh, to improve safety and increase the potential impact of our Rio Road Corridor Plan's impact. I would ask the plan to include more on how sidewalks uh, existing and new would be those that are uh, will be integrated, expanded into the neighborhood streets immediately connected to Rio Road. So basically, he's saying how do the sidewalks that are coming out of this 
the side streets get integrated into the plan. I thought that was an interesting comment and do we need any new ones in that area? Um, so I've got a couple of comments and um, let me start with uh, Belvedere. Uh, I read in the report where it noted that when the roundabout is completed, the gaps in traffic may decrease, further complicating the, that intersection and, uh, and while the green tea can offs or offset some of this traffic, but not all. It struck me when I was reading the report that there were two options, and that struck me, there were two options. One was the green tea and the other was the traffic light. The traffic light got very little write up. And I wonder whether the traffic light would be a better option for Belvedere, a permanent one, I know that there may be one, uh, uh, Ned had said he was gonna uh, submit a warrant for, a, I guess, a temporary traffic light. I hope getting the terminology correct. Uh, but it seemed to me that a traffic light instead of a green tea might be a, a better solution. And I would have liked to see the report at least go through the pros and cons in a little bit more detail. And, and really address why a traffic light wouldn't be a good option, particularly because we know that the roundabout's going to be built and there's not going to be a traffic light at John Warner Parkway and, and, and Raya. The second question, the second area that I, I, I was thinking about is the Hillsdale, uh, Old Brook, uh, Northfield intersection. Uh, I was a little bit like Tom, I, I looked, if I was coming out of Old Brook and I wanted to go to Hillsdale, you'd have to get into a, a left lane. It, it seemed to me it was a short distance to be able to turn around in that intersection. And similarly, if you were coming out of Hillsdale and wanted to go toward 29, the distances, at least in that conceptual design, seemed very short to me. In addition to that, it seemed to me they showed crosswalks for uh, pedestrians across Rio. Now I know there was a spot in halfway across, you would be able to stop and look, but that area is gonna have a lot of traffic. And I wonder whether it is really, how the, how the traffic and the pedestrians are gonna interact, particularly uh, if we're encouraging people to walk or to use bikes. I think th that's a matter of concern to me. And I think that that could be a, a, an issue. Uh, let me see if I have any other, a lot of the points that you all made, I, I think are covered. Uh, I think the, uh, I also noted that, that on Raya, which is not in the report any place, half of the street is at a 40 mile an hour speed limit and the other half is at 35. I know one of that's due to city rules and the other is due to the county rules. We ought, there should be, it seems to me there ought to be one speed limit for that entire car. I don't know what it should be, but it should be one. I think it's confusing, particularly if you're coming from 29 and going into higher speed, you're not so alert to slow down as you get to the 30, to the lower speed. And finally, I just I, I, I heard Ryan say that they're gonna that this was sort of conceptual in terms of the traffic flow, and struck me too. As I understand reading the report, they they estimated that thirty thousand vehicles currently coming on Rio from outside the area, plus whatever is in the inside the area. Uh, I think. Uh, like uh, Audrey had mentioned, the concern about capacity. I have that I have that concern as well. We are seeing a lot of building going north, coming down 29. Now, some of it's going to go straight down 29, but some is going to make that left turn, and we are encouraging them to go down John Warner Parkway and possibly Rio. And I, I wonder where it, that whether the report should have at, at some point address the fact that the traffic will increase substantially because of the building going up north. We just heard UVA the other day announced that they're going to at some point build 1400 units up north, so at North Point. So those are my comments. So uh, 
David, so uh, do you have anything further to say? Or I, let me ask them before you get to you. So we're, we're okay on time-wise a little bit. Does anybody else have any other further comments from the group, from our committee? Yes, Judy. You've lost your voice, uh, you're mute. Judy, you're mute right now. And now we can't hear you. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay, uh, one last thing. We seem to be focusing very much on the peanut shaped um, roundabout. We've mentioned the roundabout at Dunlora and John Warner. And then at the last meeting, uh, Daniel Heyer threw out perhaps a roundabout at Penn Park. So that would be into phase two. I know that roundabouts right now are the buzz thing of engineering, but if we have three types of uh, engineering designs like that on Ryle Road from 29 down to the city line, just a thought, isn't it overkill? Thank you. Um, yeah, I think, I you think. You know, I'm just asking, yeah, just a okay. thought. Well, we're, and we're the consultants still working through phase two. So I think what was what he was showing was the impact of two different types of improvements. And they're they're working through those issues and we're certainly aware of that as, as well. We don't want to over roundabout when a roundabout isn't needed. But um, that's something we'll hopefully you'll be taking a look at next month. Okay. Thank you. Um it might be might be useful to note as well from our perspective as engineers. Uh, VDOT requires us to analyze, whenever we're looking at an intersection, we have to consider a roundabout. They require us to consider it because it's such an improvement over traditional traffic methods. So, and if it shows that it works, then we're required to do a cost estimate to show, okay, is it more costly to install and what is the cost effectiveness of that? But that's, that's, Part of the reason why you see such an increase lately is, is VDOT has made that determination that um, any, any traffic signal that can be converted to a roundabout at, and still remain cost effective should be. Um, so that, that comes from, that's not just kind of a, a, a trend, it's, it's a little bit higher up than that. Thank you. Uh, any other comments on the phase one report? Okay. Well, if, if you'll if you'll give me another second. Sure, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, just want to say Hillsdale and Old Brook, the traffic signals today both change at the same time. And, a, and that's what the cause of the accident is. People go through the first red light on yellow and they assume that they can make it through the second light. But by the time they get there, which is three seconds later, it's already turned red and they go flying through red. Uh, so the signals would have to change to fix that problem, and they can be changed to fix that problem, but it costs 250000 The roundabout I proposed for uh, John Warner Parkway, which was in two pieces, uh, sort of like a dog bone, the other piece up north of the railroad bridge, uh, had continuous bike lanes, solved the problem completely with, with Belvedere, cost the same amount of money as the roundabout with VDOT proposed. They are considering that design because I submitted it to them. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, well, they did. Okay, thank you. Um, Audrey, and then I'm, I'm gonna, you're the last one. I think we are finished. Um, we've been talking about solutions to short of problems. We've been talking about increase in traffic. I don't think the, I think the John Warner and uh, Rio improvements have been made where around 2015, the GIS came in 2016-ish. Um, My question is what long-term planning is going on? I mean, what are we looking at 10, 20 years from now? Um, is there any effort going on to look at issues in, in 29 North and Rio and John Warner 20 years in, in a time frame of 20 years or more? I'm gonna let David, you wanna say something? <laughs> we always are taking uh, with our 
regional transportation plan, they look at a 20 year window, um, which looks at the overall large scale networks within the uh, metropolitan uh, uh, area region, the uh, MPO area. So that sort of is the basis of the larger network improvements and they identify the needs in, in that area uh, and at that scale. Um, so that work is, is monitored and done. You have to recognize that there is limitations for funding available to implement all those improvements, but there is a long-term view of it. And in our master planning and long range planning, when we have the opportunity to endeavor into that, we will also take those um, issues into consideration with the Crozet master plan. We did some traffic analysis to determine what long-term needs are. And we will read, try to do that in, as well. I so, read everything I can in the progress, the newspaper and media, but I haven't seen other than um, bus and commuter bus. Uh, I haven't seen anything in terms of long range road building. I think Around, building, like a bypass. Yeah, I don't, bypasses are tremendously expensive to build and the emphasis is on managing how we're gonna be, how we're gonna be mobilized in the future. And I think transit and walking is an important factor in that. Bicycling is an important factor in that. Uh, new ways of transit, not just bus and commuting is gonna be approaches that we need to to take and are trying to be emphasized. And that's why we're working so hard with the transit, uh, the transit development plan to implement those. Uh, road improvements, uh, there are recommended improvements for the 29 North corridor that we're trying to implement to continues the uh, capacity building along those existing corridors. But I think the emphasis on new large long ex extensions of roads is not something you're going to see a lot in the future. The money is fiscally costly, the environmental impacts are significant. Um, and right now, our recommendations don't call for significant new road quarters. It's using the quarters we have and the alternative transportation measures uh, that might help augment and uh, reduce um, and, and uh, add to the capacity that's on our existing road systems. So that's. Um, kind of my perspective on where we are, um, but we are constantly monitoring what our needs are and the most cost effective and innovative ways to address those needs. So, Audrey, I think maybe in the future we can arrange to have uh, the transportation planning for the area, a small briefing on that. I think that would be helpful. Okay. Yes, that was my next suggestion okay. is to have more an agenda, put this I, on I the agenda. It. Okay, well, I will uh, divulge that we are in the process of planning for that. Um, what, and that's something that we might be doing with all the CAC, CACs or strategically with CACs in the future. Uh, that's a work in progress and we're trying to get the capacity to do that sooner rather than later. But that's something that we're already planning to do. I think that would be helpful. We see developments who are uh, wanna go in, but we don't have the road capacity. Now that with, with the research park up on 29, now there may not be enough water uh, to uh, deal with that. So I would like to look at a, a longer range and see what's going on, hear from you. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay, I have one last corridor comment on phase two. Uh, that's for Serena who happens to be listening. We have not had a lot of outreach in, on the phase two in, in, in the communities in phase two. And uh, in fact, we've had none, frankly, in the last month or two that I can see. And uh, I, I may be missing it, but I think we, I mean, if we're gonna do phase two, we ought to get more of the communities along that portion of the two lane Raya portion of the road involved. Yeah, and actually, I'm going to kick it over to David. I think some of the timing has changed, um, and I respond to that. So, um, David? Yeah, we, um, Serena and I have been discussing an opportunity that we'll try to make um, for people to have input on the phase two section as it comes out so that we can get that public response. We are endeavoring to keep this project on schedule, and um, that's causing us to um, 
try to work towards getting this to the Board of Supervisors in a May or June timeframe. So it's, we're trying to figure out ways to compress some of our work to get a draft out there for public review and for your, um, your review too, as part of that public. Um, so that's why we're hoping to have a draft um, that's available um, to go over with you for your input next month. And then we would be able to take that out for public input. Um, but um, there are many things that we need to be working on, including the comp plan update. I know this and other CACs are clamoring for that work and allowing them to uh, move forward on the next steps of looking at master plans. So we're really working hard to try to keep um, projects moving forward, get them accomplished so that we can move on to our next priority topics. So that's kind of where we are right now in getting this thing done. We do plan to have a public outreach opportunity though um, that Serena and I are kind of working through. Uh, once we have a draft uh, information that we can uh, put out there for people to look at and give us feedback on. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let me close this section. Uh, I don't see any hands from any of the attendees. Uh, we're going to go on to our next topic, an overview of the entrance corridor study and the architectural review board. I want to say a couple of words, David, and then we'll see. Yes, um, I think we, we've taken a fair amount of time. And, and again, thank you very much for all your comments. We're, we're going to be um, uh, certainly listening to them and, and considering them as we move this forward. And so again, I appreciate all those comments. Uh, we did take a little bit longer um, than I thought. And so my next item uh, or the next item on the agenda was for me to, to, to actually run a PowerPoint presentation, which has been developed by the um, staff of the Architectural Review Board that really provides an overview um, of the uh, entrance quarter and ARB processes, um, what an entrance quarter is uh, and how it relates um, to uh, reviews that the Architectural Review Board does. Um, that presentation takes about 13 to 15 minutes. And I think to get you out on time, what I would propose to do is actually um, send that out to the CAC members. Um, Part of the reason that we were doing this was uh, I know that um, some members of the CAC would like to hear from the ARB uh, board members about um, how decisions are made and in particular how they relate to decisions made in the Route 29 quarter. So this presentation um, I thought would provide a good background for you. Um, I was gonna run it for you. Um, maybe take a few questions from you, and but mainly to give you some background and understanding prior to ARB members coming to talk with you. I think what might be more efficient is for me to distribute that to all of you so that you can look at it and listen to it at your own convenience. Um, and then I will set aside a little bit of time next month for any questions that you might have. And then we can um, um, answer those questions and um, also that will help us give us uh, some sense for the questions you might have for your ARB member. Um, what I, just to make sure that you know how to do the presentation though, I'm going to open it up and just show you to make sure that you can run it properly. It's pretty straightforward, um, but let me uh, do that. So this is what the PowerPoint presentation looks like when you open it. And if you're familiar with PowerPoints at all, it's a very simple thing. You go up to the top and start the slideshow um, from uh, the beginning. Hello, and thank you for your interest in the Admiral County Architectural Review Board. And it will stop, start just like that. Um, at the bottom left corner, there, there will be in... Um, small highlights, places where you can pause, go back and forth. Um, I think you might find it useful to kind of understand what the perspective is, uh, how the review process works. Uh, one thing I, I will note to you is that the ARB uh, has been trying to undertake 
um, an update of the guidelines. It's something that we have wanted to do for a number of years, but have not um, had the ability to get uh, enough staff time to work on that. Uh, the ARB has begun a very slow process of looking at the design guidelines with the hope of updating the, those over the next few years. The approach that they're taking is um, kind of a phased approach in that um, internally the ARB is going to start to look at the existing guidelines and then uh, try to update them with the hope that eventually a phase two aspect of the study would be to develop guidelines for each entrance corridor. Right now, the design guideline standards, there's only one set of standards. There are no, there's no particular guidance for each of the corridors. And that's what hopefully the ARB would like to get to. That's a very long process. Um, to get there though, it's gonna be a slow process, but it is something that the ARB is working on. So that is, um, some of the um, background for this. So if it's all right with you, uh, what I will be sending you is a link to a file where you can open this up and take a look at it, look at it at your leisure. And I will set aside a few minutes on, at next month's meeting to answer any questions you might have. And in the meantime, we will be working towards um, trying to get uh, ARB representatives to come and attend at a future meeting. Does that sound okay to everyone? Nancy, you had a question? Uh, you had your hands up, I should say. I do. Um, I may be the only person besides Marty and maybe Nicole who's actually gone to an ARB meeting on a project. But there are two very important points here. One, the Board of Supervisors can approve a project. And for those of you who live in Dunlora, Briar Point would be a marvelous case study because from what I have seen, the Board of Supervisors approves the project, but there are engineering studies, there's an ARB process in the entrance corridor and there's a site plan process. And it's quite eye-opening to me to discover even in the small site plan here in Branchlands for Linden House, just how much something can change between board approval. In this case, it was a removal of 10 parking spaces, which percentage wise had a huge impact on the Branchlands townhouse community. But in Rio Point, that's an even bigger project. Um, and so ARB, you should, you know, you think you're done with a board of supervisors, you would not be correct. The second point is that there has been floating out there for quite some time now, a concept that developers think would be really great to have a standard process for the small area plan and form based code so that they didn't have the lengthy process of going through the ARB, or if you will, the additional bureaucracy, take your pick. And that has a big impact on RIO 29. And I am very interested, and hopefully other people here are too, to know what's going on with that. I haven't heard anything. And I did, that was my memo that Marty circulated. I told him he could put my name on it, but I guess he was trying to keep me anonymous. Um, there are questions. Um, I am somewhat encouraged to hear that different entrance corridors may have different design issues. And I think that we could have different design issues between Albemarle Square and Fashion Square Mall uh, and Rio Hill for that matter. And so my questions that I posed about um, how do you decide what the form-based code architecture should look like in Albemarle Square, which has a mishmash of fairly banal architecture. And certainly we don't wanna replicate that. So I'm glad that we are finally hearing about this. I'm disappointed that more isn't happening. Thank you. Well, we'll keep pushing on it, I assure you. Okay. 
Our next uh, topic is li liaison updates. Ned, please. Good evening, everyone. Appreciate all of the uh, comments on the corridor study. I took copious notes while everybody was speaking. So if you have anything in addition that you didn't put out there, um, feel free to email those uh, to me. And I would say maybe copy the whole CAC and David as well. Yeah. Um, just as if I know people in interest of time sometimes might only say five of the six things or whatever. But if there's other comments out there, then by, by all means, share those. Um, let's see. I got a, got a little bit of a list here. So I know that Nancy had emailed me with some comments about the Wawa that did go through on consent, the special use permit. So that wasn't an action item per se that was, that was discussed as it was a consent agenda item, but it did get approved. Um, speeding, somebody mentioned that along the lines here today. Um, speeding has come up quite a bit. I've had, I've had emails from residents in Woodbrook about Woodbrook and from Woodbrook about 29. I've had folks in Belvedere about interior to Belvedere. Um, additional emails about 29 North. So I did at the end of the county executives budget presentation yesterday raised that concern again i mean this is a county-wide concern first off so and, and the the enforcement difficulty is the fact that we are a large county with speeding issues on pretty much every road and it's difficult to enforce all of them with the police force that we have um, so that's the that's the difficulty with it now there have been people out doing enforcement recently both on 29 and around other areas. And I wish the tweeters that would uh, send out tweets telling people to be careful of the speed traps would reverse their messaging and just tell people to slow down. Um, you know, we're, we're being more cautious about getting caught speeding. Maybe we should just stop speeding. Um, but that's easier said than done. And I don't mean to sound that naive, but um, you know, it takes a lot of us to figure that out. Now in Belvedere, if you're in a place with an HOA, um, as Judy probably remembers from good grief, probably 12 or 14 years ago, if you want to take on any sort of traffic calming measures in a community, it starts within the community. Petitions, VDOT wants to see a high threshold of people saying, yes, we want this before they would institute traffic calming measures. Um, and those fact, in fact, those never came to pass, did they, Judy? And done more at least where they were uh, there. Um, but nonetheless, I've brought it to the county executive team's attention. I'll be sending the emails I've received to them. And then um, we'll continue to highlight that at the board level uh, as other supervisors do in their districts as well. Um, the culverts out on side of Dunmora, not, not, the, uh, not the, the items being used for the current sidewalk project, but the one to the developer on the uh, um, Dunmora Park uh, development. So that has been come up again. I know that's been on a watch list or at least have been mentioned several times in this CAC. So I have yet again asked for update on those items and what the timing is on the project. And if the project's not to commence in an immediate fashion, why they aren't cleaning it up and are allowed to just leave it out there at store. So that matter continues to be one that um, uh, is not checked off of a list yet. So uh, I did not have, get update back on where the timing of the project is as of yet, but that's one that I'll be following up on and hopefully have more update on in March. Um, in the budget presentation yesterday, uh, specific to things that have been discussed at this CAC, there, um, there was monies made that would propose a, per excuse me, a purchase of a street sweeper so that we don't have to rely on um, MOAs with, or MOUs with the city, go ahead and purchase our own equipment to be able to run street sweepers within the urban ring uh, to, keep, to keep the uh, roadways clean. And specifically, this ha seem, it has pretty good impact on bike lanes. When we were running the pilot program, uh, there was a lot of positive feedback that actually came in saying that that's great. So we're not, and it failed because the new MOU didn't get put in place with the city. Now that's a whole different conversation I don't need to get into right now, but I was glad to see in the budget that the county executive is saying that I'm starting to provide some public works type of items for the urban ring and that'll have a big difference on RIO and, and the area the CAC pays attention to. In addition to that, 
median management and vegetation management. There is line items in the budget for that. I, I don't know the details or the, haven't gone in myself and got to that point in the budget book. But um, as I had said, that that would be uh, discussed this budget cycle. They are putting forward or the county executive is making recommendations of putting resources to the handling of these medians, both concrete or otherwise. So I think of the, um, well, the, the uh, plantings along there when you come up out of the parkway going on Dundora. Th all those type of things should be in play. So I'm looking forward to learning more about what the county executive has in mind and uh, see what all that entails and can give update as the budget progresses on that. Um, I would just say, since I mentioned the budget, the presentation was yesterday. Um, there'll be several work sessions, obviously, that the board will be uh, completing. Um, so obviously it should be, you know, I would definitely pay attention to what's going on. I always make the comment that if you want to learn what a supervisor's priorities really are, watch how they're doing things during budget time, because it will speak to what they see as high priority. Um, and then if this, I don't know if David, if, uh, if there's a way to, we could do some, maybe a budget update or two, or have a chance for even if it's just to provide some updates beyond what I do in my liaison report, um, that we might want to do that in March or April, or maybe that's more towards Marty and Marty and David, yeah. um, as you guys are interested. Um, a big thing I think you all should be paying attention to is the conversation around incentives and an affordable housing overlay. Um, during that meeting, um, I requested some case studies be done. Rio Point was one of the three that I asked for a case study to be considered on. And the idea being that if a housing over, affordable housing overlay existed, how might that project have proceeded? And what would it have produced unit wise? What would have been the check-in points for the Board of Supervisors, et cetera, Planning Commission and all of that? So as those come forward, I think that's something that should be on your radars as well uh, to be looking at to understand how something like that could work. Because it could, in a way like Nancy talks about form-based code and how that's to streamline perhaps some development in the small area plan. Well, that affordable housing overlay, if you're providing the units and housing Albemarle could streamline and take a lot of checkpoints off. So the case studies will help us understand what we really could be getting in that. Um, and I would, I would think that not only is that something to pay attention to and follow along, but that's probably a future presentation to all the CACs so that everybody understands what's meant by that. The overlay was only recommended or suggested for the development areas only at this time, uh, but more to come. I mean, that's months down the road is gonna take a lot more conversation and discussion. Um, at next week's meeting, the board will probably be having some conversations around reconstitution and, and when we get back to in-person meetings. And I only bring it up is that um, whatever the timing is on that will obviously impact all of our boards and commissions we have. It doesn't mean that if the board goes back to in person that immediately you need to as well, but there would be a time frame in which you would. So this body at some point will want to start having conversations uh, such as if the board goes back to in person on, you know, uh, in March, do we want to start in April or May or, or, or where would we want to go back in person as well? So Marty, that's one that you guys will probably need to discuss at some point. Um, then the uh, Greenbrier, I had mentioned it to the, uh, when we had our last transportation report and VDOT quarterly update, the Greenbrier light, the Woodbrook, there was a four-way stop in there. And then I had in the, in the trio had mentioned the warrant study for Belvedere if possible. So those are still on my radar that I'm talking to staff about and will continue to press or bring up. Um, to see what can see what will come of that, but I don't have any information update on that. With that, um, oh, since it was mentioned, the long range transportation planning that is done is through the Charlotte's Wild Moral Metropolitan Planning Organization. So the last one was done, I believe it was eight, 1819. And the next long range transportation planning process will kick off, not this current year, but next year. Um, so I serve on the MPO but that's usually a two year process that can take some time, but it does look out and a lot of work and effort goes into looking past just the immediacy of, you know, like, uh, like what David mentioned the next 10 or 20 years. So that's one that um, as we get closer to the MPO doing that work, it could probably be on the CAC's radar to get some updates or 
maybe a presentation on what the actual process is for long range transportation planning. And um, that's all I got, Marty. So if there's questions, happy to entertain them or requests, I can do that. Yeah, okay. I don't, uh, Peter, you have a quick question. We're gonna try to get it through on time, Peter. Yeah. Thanks, Ned, for your time and your service, and uh, applaud also the investment in uh, now Mark County may be by percentage of land or rural area, but this the challenge of facing the reality that we're in an urban area as far as where people live uh, and work and play. Because I appreciate the investment <laughs> in that. That's certainly a big plus in the bio corridor. Um, back on the, the speeding, um, just uh, two pieces. Um, one, as far as the Belvedere neighborhood itself. Part of the challenge is uh, not all of Belvedere from Rio Road into the neighborhood is all part of the HOA. The stretch from um, Rio to the center is, I don't, it, it's just fair game. And that's where a lot of the speeding starts. People come flying off that road, coming down very fast. And the speed limit there is 35 instead of 25. And I actually asked Mr. McDermott a couple months ago um, and the VDOT rep why that is and why it shouldn't be 25 throughout all of Belvedere Boulevard. Um, and that has gotten lost in the shuffle. So you may want to be at least aware of that and can help. And to points that were made earlier too about the confusion of East Rio being 35 some places and 40 some places. I also noted and asked Kevin a few months ago without a, a response yet, um, you know, West Rio Road is 35 miles an hour. East Rio Road is 40. It's basically the same road, same design, five lanes, <laughs> urban and commercial mix, lots of big institutions of schools, um, lots of traffic. West Rio Road gets a lot of commuter traffic between Georgetown and 29. Um, why is it 35 there and 40 on East Rio Road? That seems perplexing to me. I'm certainly aware that dropping it to 35 is not gonna solve the speeding problem on East Rio, but certainly it may help. So. I'm just going to talk to you about that, but I think it's relevant to the whole group since you brought it up. Thank you. Thank you. Nancy, one minute, please. Go ahead. You're muted. I know. I got it. Um, if you want a case study on why properties should be required to clear their sidewalks, go up and down Hillsdale between Greenbrier and Rio. There is a large pine tree across the sidewalk from the big storms uh, further down towards the intersection of Greenbrier and Hillsdale there is another big tree that is uh, obstructing the bike lane and throughout the corridor there is debris on sidewalks that's not quite so big but street cleaners won't solve the problem and in the bike lane itself, there's all kinds of pine needles, trash, et cetera, et cetera. I don't understand, then people were walking in the road because the sidewalks were icy for a very long time. I don't understand why Albemarle County can't get jurisdiction under the Dillon rule when Arlington County has long been able to require people to clear their sidewalks. Okay, he's got that. Okay, Daniel, please. Did, do you wanna say something, Ned? No. Yeah, the, the snow piece came up at a meeting, um, I think two meetings ago, not as an agenda item. Um, and I have to remember, David, do, we may have the authority to do it. It's a matter. Um... I, I, I've forgotten. I think we do. So I've forgotten too, and it's just been three weeks or so. But um, I will check. So that part of the I mean, part of the, the the question is is you put it in. Everybody has to do it. There's no exceptions. And there are, in my mind, there are folks that I think would struggle with that. And um, it would be problematic. Now, businesses, institutions, things like that, I think it's, you know, I don't, I, I don't include that. I'm talking about residents. And there are some folks that it not only is it improbable for them to clear their sidewalk, it's dangerous for them to try to, to do that. And they may not have the means to find others to be able to do it for them. So there, and if you, but if you put something in place like that, you can't carve out a, well, except, 
And I think that's part of where some struggle comes into play for uh, supervisors. But it's a conversation that's come up and um, I suspect the supervisors are going to have to deal with it one way or another. Are we going to do it or not? And that'll be a future agenda discussion. So there was, uh, just for your information, that or you may have forgotten, there was an article in Daily Progress about, I think, the rowing team uh, from Albemarle County who helps pro bono doing sidewalk clearing. Okay, that's enough on that. Daniel, please. <laughs> uh, no substantial updates. I'll keep it brief for it. At time, um, we're been reviewing some rezoning and special use permits largely outside of the Rio district and uh, gearing up for the the 2044 comp plan um, in, in the in the coming months. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, so last point I was going to make, uh, as a, if you don't mind, man, I'll take a, one notice uh, that the Rio Point initial uh, site review plan. Uh, if anybody has comments, has to be in by March 24th. And the action for that is April, and I can't read my, I think April 4th. But so if anybody has comments on Rio Point, uh, that's the time to get their comments into. I think Cameron is, is the uh, person. Yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, so I, uh, Judy. Yes. yes. Okay. Along those lines, you said that Cameron is the point planner um, because he and I have, have been in conversation and he did let me know that there is a change in the design, that they're planning on having townhomes now on Royal Road. So everybody needs to be very much aware of what's going on there. So your information is very timely, Marty. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay, I am going to close this meeting. I know we talked about um, possibly changing the meeting start time, but given everything is happening, I know for next month for sure there's some planning around six o'clock. Let's we'll postpone that for the, this period of time. So with that, if I want to thank everybody for participating, Carolyn, for keeping us straight on the, the technology, and we will see you in a month. Thank you. Okay, thank you.